Hello everyone, I'm Bart Massey. Welcome once again to Open Source Software Development. Today I want to continue a discussion of Git. By the way, I hope you're all staying safe and well out there in these difficult times. I know things can be tough. Having said that, let's try to distract ourselves for a bit with some software. I want to continue today talking about Git and I want to talk about the use of Git in development, sort of the more advanced things that after you get a tiny bit of experience with Git, you may want to know. And in particular, I want to talk about Git and workflows, which is an important topic. So let's dive into that stuff. So what do I mean by workflow? I mean that um, we're going to have what's, this is our way of using Git and GitHub and whatever to set up so that we understand how as we work especially in a group on a project things are handled and the the standard git workflow model it's what's called a star model we uh have a central upstream repository and each developer has a downstream repository also typically on github and then you'll have a local repository, so there's lots of repositories. If you have five developers, that would probably mean there's 11 repositories. A central one, five upstream repositories on GitHub, five local repositories on the five developers' machines. And that is a very, very typical structure for the repository. And what we're going to do is have the developers work in their local against their local repos. When they're ready, they can push those changes upstream and to their to their downstream repos up on GitHub. I really recommend that that central repo, the one at the center of the star here, be owned not by an individual developer, but by a GitHub or a GitLab organization for the project. That way, there's several people who can have the rights to do things with those repositories when needed, and that's important to have that kind of redundancy. It also provides some symmetry in the sense that there's no distinguished developer in these projects. Anyway, so you may want to choose to make an organization and make the people who are the core developers for the project be all managers or owners of that organization. So the normal sort of structure here is that that central Git, repo, Git server has a master branch that always represents something usable by outside folks. If I go close, clone that master branch, I get sort of the latest and greatest stable stuff. It'll probably also have some kind of development structure a lot of times for, you know, taking stuff that's done in some sense, but not really ready for outside use yet. And so those two branches are pretty commonly in the central repo. Uh, the normal work model for somebody using Git is they might check out locally a branch on their home machine or whatever, their personal machine, to make some changes, get them as happy as they can get, merge the, that branch with dev or master locally, then push that to their downstream repo on GitHub, and so now their changes are up where people who check in on their particular downstream repository on GitHub can see what their changes look like. When they're happy with that, they do what's called a pull request. They put in a thing that, uh, I don't remember what they call it on GitLab, but on GitHub it's called a pull request that is a request to the central repository to take your changes from the downstream repository. And when that pull request goes in, the typical rule that a project will use is that someone who's part of the project other than the person who's making the pull request should review those changes, look at those commits, which GitHub makes it pretty easy to do, and then if they're happy, push the accept pull request button, and now the stuff goes into the central server. And that's a really common model, and it works well even for small projects, and it works 
well for large projects too and ensures that there's some kind of review and supervision of what's going into that central code base which is great and yet it's not a huge amount of extra work for anybody it isn't like there's a huge amount of process that you have to wade through and again it depends on the size of your project a lot of projects i've worked with don't really have a separate dev branch upstream but if you do that you know if, if your project's big or changing rapidly it's not a bad idea and then when somebody's happy with the dev branch you know whoever is in charge of such things can decide it's time to merge dev onto master and that's what we call typically a release that release will typically get its own version number perhaps using semantic versioning and now you'll have a new thing on your upstream that people can download and try to use And I should say, when I talk about GitHub, that GitHub isn't just about Git. So far we've talked a lot about Git and the Git-related features, but that pull request manager is a nice additional tool. It's not part of Git proper. It's something that was written by GitHub. And again, GitLab provides something uh, similar. All of these things they do. There's an issue tracker. GitHub provides an issue tracking web tool for bug reports, feature requests, status reports, that sort of thing to be posted to. And there's a whole setup for managing that. I highly recommend the use of those tools. They're part of why I recommend that everyone in my class use GitHub and GitLab is, or, and or GitLab is that those tools are really, really valuable when you're doing open source development. Historically, the whole history of issue trackers, especially in open source, has been a history of frankly a lot of really awkward terrible software and part of that is because it's the history of the pre good internet world but part of and certainly the pre good web world but part of it is just that it's hard and so having tools of this quality is fantastic github has also introduced recently a kanban board a project board typically that was done by third-party tools like trello I have very mixed feelings about project boards. They're part of a standard agile process. If you're doing something like Scrum, you will be using these tools. And the GitHub one seems to me, although I have very minimal experience with it myself, seems to me to be very good. I've been impressed by its feature set and I've been impressed by its usability. So if you want such a thing, rather than just doing what historically open source projects have done and use the issue tracker to manage your uh, tasks then yeah, by all means the other thing that github has provided more and more of recently is options for hosting web stuff documentation is an important part of any open source project uh publicity and accessibility are part of any open source project and github pages and gitlab again has a similar thing and both gitlab and github provide wikis as an alternative are great ways to have a website for your stuff that's bound very closely to your stuff and that can be really really valuable. so all those are great tools i highly recommend that you at least consider taking advantage of all of them i do all the time and have never been sorry for having done so i have a lot of stuff i could talk about here as far as fancy use of git so at some point you get through the git basics here's a few topics i'm going to go through them really fast because i feel like i don't want to try to dive into them in detail i'll do some later lecture well where, where i'll talk about lecturing where i'll talk about examples and walk through this first of all an important thing to understand about git that gets emphasized a lot these days by people talking and writing about git is that the poll command git pull is actually a combination of two things it's git fetch which fetches commits from the upstream repository that's not in yours and brings them in and that's all that fetch does it doesn't touch your working directory and then the other one is git merge which is a tool that works only on your working directory essentially in this situation and so when you do a pull essentially 
new changes from upstream are fetched and then are merged into your current working repository. That's important because it means you can be selective. You can fetch stuff before you merge it, look at what you want to do, what you do want to merge, whether your state is consistent with the state from upstream, and that gives you a lot of control, so it's an important thing to keep in mind. Something we haven't talked about with Git, but it's an important idea to get to understand, is the idea that Git tries really hard to keep you from altering history. And that's done partly for security reasons, partly performance reasons, partly just plain old convenience reasons. But in any case, once you've made a commit, you really can't change stuff before that commit without essentially rewriting all the history up to that point. And that is a doable thing. You should get yourself familiar with git commit dash dash amend which is a mechanism for rewriting the current commit, which can be really, really convenient a lot of times, especially if you haven't pushed it upstream. There's git rebase, which is a way to rewrite a bunch of past history in a way that makes you compatible with upstream and can be really important. In particular, the dash I flag of rebase is great. And you should understand that if you rewrite history and then push it upstream, you're gonna mess up everybody around you. So it's really, really discouraged. You, If you do that and you need other people to do it, they need to be really at the current state of Git. They need to be aware that you've rewritten history and pushed upstream and they need to be prepared to take your upstream chain, upstreamed rewritten world. And so be really careful with push minus F. Be aware it exists, but don't do it lightly and don't do it without talking with the rest of at least your core team. There's a thing called the ref log, and if you run the ref log command of git, you'll get a whole bunch of commit IDs for commits that correspond to essentially every change you've made to the repository since its beginning, if you haven't cleaned them up. And that's really, really convenient. One of the things that happens with git is it's really, really easy to get your repository in a messed up state and panic and go, oh man, my repository's in a messed up state. I'm just gonna throw away all my history and start over. Never, ever, ever do that. And the ref log is a key tool in untangling what happened and restoring sanity to your repository without losing any information. Having said that, if you know you're about to do something like a scary rebase that might go wrong, Make a copy of the repository before you start. It makes it really, really convenient to recover when the bad thing happens. And so just make a copy of everything, the working directory, the Git repository, the whole nine yards. And because Git is fiddly and error prone and very complex, you shouldn't be shy about asking for help. If you're confused about how Git works, you can ask me. I have a pretty good idea. I can find other people to ask when I get stuck, which does happen. And so this is one of those things where, in spite of the huge volume of tutorials and manuals and guides and books out there, every so often you're going to be like, eh, I don't really understand this. And you'll Google for you know, answers and Stack Overflow will appear or something else will appear and make you just more confused. Nothing wrong with asking for help, and I'd really encourage you to reach out if you start to have issues with your Git. I can help you in tandem. So that's what I have for you. Thanks much, as always, for listening, and as always, please do stay safe and well during these difficult times. I will talk to you again soon.